We are doing travels uh, with Charlie, with Professor Jake. Please take it away. All right. Good. It's good morning for you West Coasters out there. So good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to resume. Uh, it's 1.45 in my book. Uh, and basically, he's just been reminiscing about San Francisco as he passes through. And now he's going to go uh, to Monterey. In my young days in Monterey County, 100 miles south of San Francisco, everyone was a Republican. My family was Republican. I might still be one if I had stayed there. President Harding stirred me toward the Democratic Party and President Hoover cemented me there. If I indulge in personal political history, it is because I think my experience may not be unique. I arrived in Monterey and the fight began. My sisters are still Republicans. Civil war is supposed to be the bitterest of wars and surely family politics are the most vehement and venomous. I can discuss politics coldly and analytically with strangers. That was not possible with my sisters. We ended each session panting and spent with rage. On no point was there any compromise and no quarter was asked or given. Each evening we promised, let's just be friendly and loving, no politics tonight. And 10 minutes later, we would be screaming at each other, John Kennedy was a so-and-so. Well, if that's your attitude, how can you reconcile Dick Nixon? Now let's be calm, we're reasonable people, let's explore this. I have explored it, how about the Scotch whiskey? Oh, if you take that line, how about the grocery in Santa Ana? How about checkers, my beauty? Father would turn in his grave if he heard you. No, don't bring him in because he would be a Democrat today. Listen to you, Bobby Kennedy is out buying sacks full of votes. <laughs> you mean no Republican ever bought a vote? Don't make me laugh. You know, this was written in 1960, but I'm hearing the same conversations. <laughs> I feel like I'm reading the headlines here. <laughs> <laughs> it was bitter and it was endless. We dug up obsolete convention weapons and insults to hurl back and forth. You talk like a communist. Well, you sound suspiciously like Genghis Khan. <laughs> it was awful. A stranger hearing us would have called the police to prevent bloodshed. And I don't think we were the only ones. I believe this was going on all over the country in private. It must have been only publicly that the nation was tongue-tied. Well, that's not the same anymore, for sure. The main purpose of this homecoming seemed to be fighting over politics. But in between, I visited old places. There was a touching reunion in Johnny Garcia's bar in Monterey with tears and embraces, speeches and endearments in the poco Spanish of my youth. Now this, is, is a very interesting point in the book. Um, and he's really gonna go into this bar scene. And I have my college students actually just write an essay on this bar scene, because there's so much in it. Um, you know, we'll go through it, but just, uh, it's a really interesting segment. There were Jolan Indians, I remembered as shirt-tailed chamacos. The years rolled away. We danced formally, hands locked behind us and we sang the Southern County Anthem. There was a young guy from Holan, got sick from leaving Ha alone. We want to king kitty, king kitty to get something pretty. Puta chingada cabron. I'm not gonna translate that for you. <laughs> it's nasty language. I hadn't heard it in years. It was old home week. The years crawled back in their holes. It was the Monterey where they used to put a wild bull and a grizzly bear in the ring together, a place of sweet and sentimental violence. And I actually looked that up and that's true. They used to do that. They used to put like crazy wild animals in a ring together and have them fight to the death. And a wise innocence as yet unknown and therefore undirtied by undiapered minds. So he's going back to this bar and he's using a lot of language that most people reading this will have no idea what he's talking about. Um, and he's doing that to set up that this is a very particular place in Monterey that he went to where a lot of the locals and the kind of, I would say, kind of rougher gentlemen probably hung out at. Um, 
And so he's setting us up for that by using language that we're probably not going to understand to say that this is a very specific place. We sat at the bar and Johnny Garcia regarded us with his tear blown Gallego eyes. His shirt was open and a gold medal on a chain hung at his throat. He leaned close over the bar and said to the nearest man, look at it, Juanito here gave it to me years ago, brought it from Mexico, La Morena, La Rogencita de Guadalupe. And look, he turned the gold, the gold oval, my name and his. So Steinbeck is Juanito, uh, John, and he had gotten this guy this medal with both of their names engraved on it in gold from Mexico. And this guy's worn it ever since. So he's probably had this for like 50 years. <clears throat> I said, scratched with a pin, I have never taken it off, said Johnny. A big dark paisano I didn't know stood on the rail and leaned over the bar. Favor, he asked, and without looking, Johnny extended the medal. The man kissed it, said gracias, and went quickly out through the swinging doors. Johnny's chest swelled with emotion and his eyes were wet. Juanito, he said, come home. Come back to your friends. We love you. We need you. This is your seat, compadre. Do not leave it vacant. I must admit, I felt the old surge of love and oratory, and I haven't a drop of Galician blood. Gunado mio, I said sadly. I live in New York now. I don't like New York, Johnny said. You've never been there. I know. That's why I don't like it. You have to come back. You belong here. I drank deeply and darned if I didn't find myself making a speech. The old words unused for so long came rattling back to me. <laughs> and this is his speech. <laughs> Let your heart have ears, my uncle, my friend. We are not baby skunks, you and I. Time has settled some of our problems. Silence, he said. I will not hear it. It is not true. You still love wine. You still love girls. What has changed? I know you. No me cagas, niño. Te cago nunca. There was a great man named Thomas Wolf, and he wrote a book called You Can't Go Home Again, and that is true. Liar, said Johnny. This is your cradle, your home. And suddenly he hit the bar with the oaken indoor ball bat he used in arguments to keep the peace. <laughs> oh, gosh. In the fullness of time, maybe a hundred years, this should be your grave. The bat fell from his hand and he wept at the prospect of my future demise. I puddled up at the prospect myself. I gazed at my empty glass. These Gallegos have no manners. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, Johnny said. Oh, forgive me. And he filled us up. The lineup at the bar was silent now. Dark faces with a courteous lack of expression. <laughs> to your homecoming, compadre, Johnny said. John the Baptist. Get the hell out of those potato chips. Conejo de mi alma, I said. Rabbit of my soul, hear me out. The big dark one came over in from the street, leaned over the bar and kissed Johnny's medal and went out again. I said irritably, there was a time when a man could be listened to. Must I buy a ticket? Must I make a reservation to tell a story? Johnny turned to, to, the, to the silent bar. Silence, he said fiercely and took up his indoor ball bat. I will now tell you true things, brother-in-law. Step into the street, strangers, foreigners, thousands of them. Look to the hills, a pigeon loft. Today I walked the length of Alvarado Street and back by the Calle Principal and I saw nothing but strangers. This afternoon I got lost in Peter's Gate. I went to the field of love back of Joe Duck's, Duckworks house by the ballpark. It's a used car lot. My nerves are jangled by traffic lights. Even the police are strangers, foreigners. I went to the Carmel Valley where once we could shoot a 30-30 in any direction. Now you couldn't shoot a marble knuckles down without wounding a foreigner. And Johnny, I don't mind people, you know that, but these are rich people. They plant geraniums in big pots, swimming <laughs> pools where frogs and crayfish used to wait for us. No, my goatly friend, if this were my home, would I get lost in it? If this were my home, could I walk the streets and hear no blessing? That's a, that's a very interesting line. If this were my home, could I walk the streets and hear no blessing? 
Johnny was slumped casually over the bar. But here, Juanito, it's the same. We don't let them in. I looked down the line of faces. Yes, here it is better. But can I live on a bar stool? Let us not fool ourselves. What we knew is dead. And maybe the greatest part of what we were is dead. What's out there is new and perhaps good, but it's nothing we know. Johnny held his temples between his cupped hands and his eyes were bloodshot. Where are the great ones? Tell me, where's Willie Tripp? Dead, Johnny said hollowly. Where is Peon, Johnny, Pom Pom, Ms. Gregg, Stevie Field? Dead, 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 he echoed. Ed Ricketts? Whitey's number one and two? Where's Sonny Boy? Ankle Varney, Jesus Maria Corcoran, Joe Portigy, Shorty Lee, Flora Wood, and that girl who kept spiders in her hat. Dead, all dead, Johnny moaned. It's like we was in a bucket of ghosts, said Johnny. No, they're not true ghosts. We're the ghosts. The big dark one came in and Johnny held out his medal for kissing without being asked. <laughs> Johnny turned and walked with widespread legs back to the bar mirror. He studied his face for a moment, picked up a bottle, took out the cork, smelled it, tasted it. Then he looked at his fingernails. There was a stir of restlessness along the bar. Shoulders hunched, legs were uncrossed. There's going to be trouble, I said to myself. Johnny came back and delicately set the bottle on the bar between us. His eyes were wide and dreamy. Johnny shook his head. I guess you don't like us anymore. I guess maybe you're too good for us. His fingertips played slow chords on an invisible keyboard on the bar. For just a moment, I was tempted. I heard the wail of trumpets and the clash of arms. But hell, I'm too old for it. I made the door in two steps. I turned. Why does he kiss your medal? He's placing bets. Okay, see you tomorrow, Johnny. The double door swung to behind me. I was on Alvarado Street, slashed with neon light, and around me, it was nothing but strangers. It's a very interesting little part of the book. I've never heard anybody refer to other people as baby skunks. That's very interesting. <laughs> But, you know, he's bringing, he, he's going back to this place that as a, you know, 20 something, maybe late 20s, you know, he used to go to all the time. And I don't know if you never met, there was a, a name there, Ed Ricketts, where he's asking about Ed Ricketts. Well, him and Ed Ricketts wrote a book, wrote a book called The Sea of Cortez, where they um, did all this stuff with uh, marine animals and mammal and uh, uh, crustaceans and shellfish. And they actually found hundreds of new species of marine life. So Steinbeck has a very interesting uh, kind of past, but that's the Ed Ricketts he mentioned. The guy says he's dead. So all these people that they knew that they hung out with were all, had all passed on. And um, what Steinbeck is feeling is that he doesn't really belong there anymore. I mean, it's a totally different place than when he was in Monterey. Now it's a tourist destination and it's not the blue collar kind of beat down place it was when he was growing up when they put a bull and a grizzly bear in a ring together. So, uh, very interesting part of the book, especially the language that he uses. Anybody ever have like a favorite bar or restaurant um, that you went to over and over again at a certain period in your life and then maybe 20, 30 years later, you went back to that same exact place? Anybody have a experience of that? Certainly there was the blue moon in Seattle. Yeah, still there. That is it? Yeah. I didn't go there, but a lot of people did. A lot of colleges. What's the name? The Blue Moon. A lot of artists. Did Kerouac go there? Writers. Yeah. Near the university. Mm. We're reading a book here called The, the um, Tender Bar. And the whole, I would say 80% of it takes place in a bar yeah, right? in yeah. Long Island. Um, and it's very interesting because all of these characters are drawn out. I have a question that came up here. What did he mean by "we are the ghosts"? Uh, what did he mean? What What did he mean by that? What did he mean by "we are the ghosts"? Yeah, let me read that. Let me let me read that again for you too. 
So he just asks, uh, so there's Johnny is Johnny Garcia who owns the bar. So he just asked him about all the people and Johnny says dead, all dead. And then it's like we was in a bucket of ghosts said Johnny. And then Steinbeck says, no, they're not true ghosts. We're the ghosts. That's the line. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll do what I do to my college students or what a psycho good psychologist does. What do you think it means? <laughs> <laughs> you know Steinbeck better than I do. <laughs> All right, you're not going for that one. All right. Um, no, well, <laughs> no, I mean, it's not, I don't have all the, the answers, actually very few. It's like we was in a bucket of ghosts. I think that's very interesting. We was in a bucket, <laughs> right? And then he says, no, they're not true ghosts. We're the ghosts. Well, because the people that they remember themselves are. So there, Steinbeck is going back into this place where he was a particular kind of person. It's 40, 50 years ago. That person is the ghost because he's not dead because Steinbeck's still alive, but that part of himself no longer exists. Thank you. How was that? Is that pretty good? That was good. <laughs> Just pulled that like a rabbit out of my head. <laughs> whether it's you, whether you it's remotely true, calling. <laughs> yeah, whether it's remotely true or not, I don't know, but it sounds pretty damn good. So, yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much what most of being a teacher is like. How's that sound? They're like, that's pretty good. I'm like, there you go. <laughs> all right. So now we're gonna we're leaving the bar, and I, the notes I, I have notes all over my book, and so up up top here I have personal hyphen universal and universal hyphen personal in other words what steinbeck's doing here is he's giving you a really personal view of where he came so that we can kind of understand through a universal lens because everybody has a personal perspective right but he's given it to us really specifically to make it universal but then also that universal then he's asking us to kind of personalize it which i find interesting because we're because I can think back to where I grew up, right? Which is Saddlebrook, New Jersey, right across the GW Bridge from New York City. And I can think about times when I went back um, where, you know, my friends are all from high school, lined up along the bar. I've been all over the world and they've been at the bar. And, uh, you know, it's, it's different. It's, you know, and you try to make conversation and it's like Bruce Springsteen's song, Glory Days, um, you know, and, and you can do that for a little while. And then you think, I can't stay here anymore. <laughs> In my flurry of nostalgic spite, I have done the Monterey Peninsula a disservice. It is a beautiful place, clean, well-run and progressive. The beaches are clean where once they festered with fish guts and flies. The canneries, remember it was famous for Cannery Road, yeah. the canneries which once put up a sickening stench are gone. Their place is filled with restaurants, antique shops and the lake. They fish for tourists now, not pilchards, and that species they are not likely to wipe out. <laughs> and Carmel, begun by starveling writers and unwanted painters, is now a community of the well-to-do and the retired. If Carmel's founders should return, they could not afford to live there, but it wouldn't go that far. They would be instantly picked up as suspicious characters and deported over the city line. <laughs> You know, and, and, and you know, one of the reasons I love this book is because I'm in place studies. Um, and he write, and it's beautiful how he's writing about place here. And that's true. I mean, Carmel was a starving artist, little like quadri back in the day. And, and now it's one of the most affluent places in, in California. The place of my origin had changed. And having gone away, I had not changed with it. And that's why he's the ghost. He hadn't changed, and so the part of himself that no longer exists, that's it. In my memory, it stood as it once did, and its outward appearance confused and angered me. What I am about to tell must be the experience of very many in this nation where so many wander and come back. I called on old and valued friends. I thought their hair had receded a little bit more than mine. The greetings were enthusiastic. The memories flooded up. Old crimes and old triumphs were brought out and dusted. And suddenly my attention wandered and looking at my ancient friend, I saw that his wandered also. 
and it was true what I had said to Johnny Garcia. I was the ghost. My town had grown and changed and my friend along with it. Now returning as changed to my friend as my town was to me, I distorted his picture and muddied his memory. I went away, I had died, and so became fixed and unchangeable. And I'll, and I'll say this, I just reconnected with one of my oldest friends. Well, actually my oldest friend in the world. We were, our, our mothers bowled in a church bowling league together. And so when we were two and three, we used to crawl around like behind the bar together and they'd have to find out where we were. And then we went to grammar school together, high school, played high school basketball together. And he had the same last name as me and we looked alike. And his sister was a paternal twin. So everybody called us the Jacob triplets. Um, <laughs> But I was not a triplet. I had an older sister. But, but anyway, I just kind of reconnected with him because my wife and I were up in New York for Thanksgiving. And I left him a note on his porch um, under a rock. And he called me a few hours later. But unfortunately, I was already on my way back to Richmond because it was his ex-wife's house. Now it's not his house anymore. But um, he called me up and, and it was interesting. You know, we were talking and, um, you know, I, I kind of really get what Steinbeck is saying here. You know, you can talk for a little while because you have all these memories together, but then your lives are so different. Um, it's a very interesting exercise to do. And he says, uh, you know, so I went away, I had died, and so became fixed and unchangeable. My friend did have a good laugh when I told him I was teaching at a seminary, though. He had a, he laughed for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and he's, he's like, no, really, what are you doing? I'm like, no, no, really. It's like, what are you doing? I'm like, all right. I'm sure he told everybody else that and they had a good laugh. Uh, my return caused only confusion and uneasiness. Although they could not say it, my old friends wanted me gone so that I could take my proper place in the pattern of remembrance. And I wanted to go for the same reason. Tom Wolf was right. You can't go home again because home has ceased to exist except in the mothballs of memory. It's a really beautiful, deep, you know, meditation on, on place and home. My departure was flight, but I did do one formal and sentimental thing before I turned my back. I drove up to Fremont's Peak, the highest point for many miles around. I climbed the last spiky rocks to the top. Here among these blackened granite outcrops, General Fremont made his stand against the Mexican army and defeated it. When I was a boy, we occasionally found cannonballs and rusted bayonets in the area. This solitary stone peak overlooks the whole of my childhood and youth, the great Salinas Valley stretching south for nearly a hundred miles. The town of Salinas where I was born, now spreading like crabgrass toward the foothills. Mount Toro on the, on the brother range to my west, was a rounded benign mountain and to the north Monterey Bay shone like a blue platter. I felt and smelled and heard the wind blow up from the long valley. It smelled of the brown hills of wild oats. I remembered how once in that part of youth that is deeply concerned with death, I wanted to be buried on this peak where without eyes I could see everything I knew and loved for in those days there was no world beyond the mountains. And I remembered how intensely I felt about my internment. It is strange and perhaps fortunate that when one's time grows nearer, one's interest in it flags as death becomes a fact rather than a pageantry. Here on these high rocks, my memory myth repaired itself. Charlie, having explored the area, sat at my feet, his fringed ears blowing like laundry on a line. That is a great visual. <laughs> His nose, moist with curiosity, sniffed the wind-borne pattern of a hundred miles. You wouldn't know, my Charlie, that right down there in that little valley I fished for trout with your namesake, my Uncle Charlie. And over there, see where I'm pointing? My mother shot a wildcat. Straight down there, 40 miles away, our family ranch was Old Starvation Ranch. Can you see that darker place there? Well, that's a tiny canyon with a clear and lovely stream bordered with wild azaleas and fringed with big oaks. And on one of those oaks, my father burned his name with a hot iron together with the name of the girl he loved. In the long years, the bark grew over the burn and covered it. 
And just a little while ago, a man cut that oak for firewood and his splitting wedge uncovered my father's name and the man sent it to me. In the spring, Charlie, when the valley is carpeted with blue lupi lup lupines, lupines, like a flowery sea, there's the smell of heaven up here, the smell of heaven. I printed it once more on my eyes, south, west, and north. And then we hurried away from the permanent and changeless past where my mother is always shooting a wildcat and my father is always burning his name with his love. That's beautiful, just mm -hmm. beautiful. You know, and that's the last time he ever looked at what, what is his favorite place. And he had, and he wrote about it, you know, and he, he captured it. But I love that where my mother is always shooting a wildcat and my father is always burning his name with his love. Beautiful. All right. It would be pleasant to be able to say of my travels with Charlie, quote, I went out to find the truth about my country and I found it. And then it would be such a simple matter to set down my findings and leave, lean back comfortably with a fine sense of having discovered truths and taught them to my readers. I wish it were that easy. But what I carried in my head and deeper in my perceptions was a barrel of worms. I discovered long ago in collecting and classifying marine animals that what I found was closely intermeshed with how I felt at the moment. External reality has a way of being not so external after all. This monster of a land, this mightiest of nations, this spawn of the future, turns out to be the macrocosm of microcosm me. If an Englishman or a Frenchman or an Italian should travel my route, see what I saw, hear what I heard, their stored pictures would, not, would be not only different from mine, but equally different from one another. If other Americans reading this account should feel it true, that agreement would only mean that we are alike in our Americanness. From start to finish, I found no strangers. If I had, I might be able to report them more objectively, but these are my people and this is my country. If I found matters to criticize and to deplore, there were tendencies equally present in myself. If I were to prepare one immaculately inspected generality, it would be this. For all of our enormous geographic range, for all of our sectionalism, for all of our interwoven breeds drawn from every part of the ethnic world, we are a nation, a new breed. Americans are much more American than they are Northerners, Southerners, Westerners, or Easterners. Ah, what do you think? How has that changed? He says, yeah. we are, let me read that again and think about this. Americans are much more American than they are Northerners, Southerners, Westerners, or Easterners. What do you think? Is that, has that changed a bit? I think it has. Yes. We've got some yeses over here. Yes. Yeah. I think Steinbeck's really also, I think he's really trying to find a unifying factor here. Um, unfortunately, I think for those of us who live in this year, um, it's, it's deteriorated a bit. You think he's kind of smoothing over some differences too? I mean, maybe he's taking sort of a nostalgic long view of what's going on. I think so. I, I think he's trying to, you know, I think he's trying to put a good spin on this but i also think that it, it was a different time i mean it was and uh i think he's he's ex trying to express that time i mean of course america had problems there and one of our future chapters is totally ugly ugly chapter about about one of those issues and it's very very ugly serious chapter um but i think he's trying to be positive and um trying to find some commonality here he says um and descendants of English, Irish, Italian, Jewish, German, Polish are essentially American. This is not patriotic whoop de doo It is carefully observed fact. California Chinese, Boston Irish, Wisconsin German, yes, and Alabama Negroes have more in common 
then they have a part. And this is the more remarkable because it has happened so quickly. It is a fact that Americans from all sections and of all racial extractions are more alike than the Welsh are like the English, the Lancashire man like the Cockney, or for that matter, the Lowland Scot like the Highlander. It is astonishing that this has happened in less than 200 years and most of it in the last 50. The American identity is an exact and provable thing. Um, I think he's, he's calling on the ideal and not the reality. And it's also interesting, he hasn't traveled through the South. And that's, yeah, that's where the other <laughs> chapter is gonna happen. And that's gonna change him a little bit, uh, a, a lot actually. Yeah, I think he's, I think he wants to see. Um, I think he wants to see the experiment work. I think he's invested the last three, three and a half months and he's, he's had some really interesting conversations, but you're right, he has not journeyed to the South yet. And in New Orleans, he's gonna see something totally different. As did I when I went there from the oh. North. I was absolutely shocked. And Bob had to inform me that all big Southern cities were pretty much like that. What, what year was that? Oh gosh, 1970s, 1970s. Okay, yeah, yeah. Starting on my return journey, I realized by now that I could not see everything. My impressionable gelatin plate was getting muddled. I determined to inspect two more sections and then call it a day, Texas and a sampling of the deep south. From my reading, it seemed to me that Texas is emerging as a separate force and that the South is in the pain of labor with the nature of its future child still unknown. Yeah. And I have thought that such is the bitterness of the labor that the child has been forgotten. This journey had been like a full dinner of many courses set before a starving man. At first, he tries to eat all of everything. But as the meal progresses, he finds he must forego some things to keep his appetite and his taste buds functioning. Now that's a great meditation on travel. You know, he starts out, he hasn't traveled in a long time, so he's trying to experience everything. And then he realizes I can't do that. I need to experience what I can experience to the fullest, but then let everything else go. And that's a very kind of wise thing. Um, I bucketed Rosinante out of California by the shortest possible route, one I knew well from the old days of the 1930s, from Salinas to Los Baños, through Fresno and Bakersfield, then over the pass and into the Mojave Desert. That, uh, me and Jess actually did that, did that exact route once through <clears throat> the Mojave, and if you've never been through the Mojave Desert, it is one of the most eerily beautiful places on earth, like just, and my favorite composer, Harold Budd, who died from COVID a year and a half ago, was from the Mojave Desert and his music sounded just like it. A burned and burning desert even this late in the year, its hills like piles of black cinders in the distance and the rutted floor sucked dry by the hungry sun. It's easy enough now on the high speed road in a dependable and comfortable car with stopping places for shade in every service station vaunting its refrigeration but I can remember when we came to it with prayer, listening for trouble in our laboring old motors, drawing a plume of, street of steam from our boiling radiators. Then the broken down wreck by the side of the road was in real trouble unless someone stopped to offer help. And I have never crossed it without sharing something with those early families foot dragging through this terrestrial hell, leaving the white skeletons of horses and cattle which still mark the way. The Mojave is a big desert and a frightening one. It's as though nature tested a man for endurance and constancy to prove whether he was good enough to get to California. This shimmering dry heat made visions of water on the flat plain. And even when you drive at high speed, the hills that mark the boundaries recede before you. Charlie, always a dog for water, panted asthmatically, jarring his whole body with the effort and a good eight inches of his tongue hung out flat as a leaf and dripping. I pulled off the road into a small gully to give him water from my 30 gallon tank. But before I let him drink, I poured water all over him and on my hair and shoulders and shirt. The air is so dry that evaporation makes you feel suddenly cold. 
I opened a can of beer from my refrigerator and sat well inside the shade of Rosinante, looking out at the sun-pounded plain dotted here and there with clumps of sagebrush. About 50 yards away, two coyotes stood watching me, their tawny coats blending with sand and sun. I knew that with any quick or suspicious movement of mine, they would drift into invisibility. With the most casual slowness, I reached down my new rifle from its sling over my bed, the 222 with its bitter little high speed long range stings. Very slowly, I brought the rifle up. Perhaps in the shade of my house, I was half hidden by the blinding light inside. The little rifle has a beautiful telescope sight with a wide field. The coyotes had not moved. I got both of them in the field of my telescope and the glass brought them very close. Their tongues lolled out so that they seemed to smile mockingly. They were favored animals, not starved, but well furred, the golden hair tempered with black guard hairs. Their little lemon yellow eyes were plainly visible in the glass. I moved the crosshairs to the breast of the right hand animal and pushed the safety. My elbows on the table steadied the gun the crosshairs lay unmoving on the brisket. And then the coyote sat down like a dog and its right rear paw came up to scratch the right shoulder. My finger was reluctant to touch the trigger. I must be getting very old and my ancient conditioning worn thin. Coyotes are vermin. They steal chickens. They thin the ranks of quail and all other game birds. They must be killed. They are the enemy. My first shot would drop the sitting beast and the other would whirl to fade away. I might very well pull him down with a running shot because I am a good rifleman. But I did not fire. My training said shoot and my age replied, there isn't a chicken within 30 miles. And if there are any, they aren't my chickens. And this waterless place is not quail country. Nope. These boys are keeping their figures with kangaroo rats and jackrabbits, and that's vermin eating vermin. Why should I interfere? Kill them, my training said. Everyone kills them. It's a public service. My finger moved to the trigger. The cross was steady on the breast just below the panting tongue. I could imagine the splash and jar of angry steel, the leap and struggle. Again, the torn heart failed. And then not too long later, the shadow of a buzzard and another. By that time, I would be long gone out of the desert and across the Colorado River. And beside the sagebrush, there would be a naked eyeless skull, a few picked bones, a spot of black dried blood and a few rags of golden fur. I guess I'm too old and too lazy to be a good citizen. The second coyote stood sideways to my rifle. I moved the crosshairs to his shoulder and held steady. There was no question of missing with that rifle at that range. I owned both animals. Their lives were mine. I put the safety on and laid the rifle on the table. Without the telescope, they were not so intimately close. The hot blast of light tussled the air to shimmering. Then I remembered something I heard long ago that I hope is true. It was unwritten law in China. So my informant told me that when one man saved another's life, he became responsible for that life to the end of its existence. For having interfered with a course of events, the savior could not escape his responsibility. And that has always made good sense to me. Now I had a token responsibility for two live and healthy coyotes. In the delicate world of relationships, we are tied together for all time. I opened two cans of dog food and left them as a votive. I have driven through the Southwest many times and even more often have flown over it, a great and mysterious wasteland, a sun punished place. It is a mystery, something concealed and waiting. It seems deserted, free of parasitic man, but this is not entirely so. Follow the double line of wheel tracks through sand and rock and you will find a habitation somewhere huddled in a protected place with a few trees pointing their roots at under earth water, a patch of starveling corn and squash and strips of jerky hanging on a string. There is a breed of desert men, 
not hiding exactly, but gone to sanctuary from the sins of confusion. If anybody's ever interested about reading about the desert, Edward Abbey is a yeah. really interesting writer about the desert. America's favorites. At night in this waterless air, the stars come down just out of reach of your fingers. In such a place lived the hermits of the early church, piercing to infinity with unlittered minds. That is another one of those lines, right? In such a place lived the hermits of the early church, piercing to infinity with unlittered minds. The great concepts of oneness and of majestic order seem always to be born in the desert. The quiet counting of the stars and observation of their movements came first from desert places. I have known desert men who chose their places with quiet and slow passion, rejecting the nervousness of a watered world. These men have not changed with the exploding times except to die and be replaced by others like them. And always there are mysteries in the desert stories told and retold of secret places in the desert mountains where surviving clans from an older era wait to reemerge. Usually, these groups guard treasures hidden from the waves of conquest, the golden artifacts of an archaic Montezuma, or a mine so rich that its discovery would change the world. If a stranger discovers their existence, he is killed or so absorbed that he is never seen again. These stories have an inevitable pattern, untroubled by the question, if none return, how is it known what is there? Oh, it's there, all right. But if you find it, you will never be found. That's an interesting bit of mythology there. And there is another monolithic tale which never changes. Two prospectors in partnership discover a mine of preternatural richness, of gold or diamonds or rubies. They load themselves with samples as much as they can carry, and they mark the place in their minds by landmarks all around. Then on the way out to the other world, one dies of thirst and exhaustion, but the other crawls on, discarding most of the treasure he has grown too weak to carry. He comes at last to a settlement or perhaps is found by other prospecting men. They examine his samples with great excitement. Sometimes in the story, the survivor dies after leaving directions with his rescuers, or again, he is nursed back to strength. Then a well-equipped party sets out to find the treasure and it can never be found again. That is the invariable end of the story. It is never found again. I have heard this story many, many times and it never changes. There is nourishment in the desert for myth, but myth must somewhere have its roots in reality. And there are true secrets in the desert. In the war of sun and dryness against living things, life has its secrets of survival. Life, no matter on what level, must be moist or it will disappear. I find most interesting the conspiracy of life in the desert to circumvent the death rays of the all-conquering sun. The beaten earth appears defeated and dead, but it only appears so. A vast and inventive organization of living matter survives by seeming to have lost. The gray and dusty sage wears oily armor to protect its inward small moistness. Some plants engorge themselves with water in the rare rainfall and store it for future use. Animal life wears a hard, dry skin or an outer skeleton to defy the desiccation. And every living thing has developed techniques for finding or creating shade. Small reptiles and rodents burrow or slide below the surface or cling to the shaded side of an outcropping. Movement is slow to preserve energy. And it is a rare animal which can or will defy the sun for long. A rattlesnake will die in an hour of full sun. Some insects of bolder inventiveness have devised personal refrigeration systems. Those animals which must drink moisture get it at second hand a rabbit from a leaf, a coyote from the blood of a rabbit. One may look in vain for living creatures in the daytime, but when the sun goes and the night gives consent, a world of creatures awakens and takes up its intricate pattern. Then the hunted come out and the hunters and hunters of the hunters. The night awakes 
to buzzing and to cries and barks. When, very late in the history of our planet, the incredible accident of life occurred, a balance of chemical factors combined with temperature in quantities and in kinds so delicate as to be unlikely, all came together and the retort of time and a new thing emerged, soft and helpless and unprotected in the savage world of unlife. Then processes of change and variation took place in the organisms so that one kind became different from all others. But one ingredient, perhaps the most important of all, is planted in every life form, the factor of survival. No living thing is without it, nor could life exist without this magic formula. Of course, each form developed its own machinery for survival, and some failed and disappeared while others peopled the earth. The first life might easily have been snuffed out and the accident may never have happened again, but once it existed, its first quality, its duty, preoccupation, direction, and end, shared by every living thing, is to go on living. And so it does, and so it will, until some other accident cancels it. And the desert, the dry and sun-lashed desert, is a good school in which to observe the cleverness and the infinite variety of techniques of survival under pitiless opposition. Life could not change the sun or water the desert, so it changed itself. The desert, being an unwanted place, might well be the last stand of life against unlife. For in the rich and moist and wanted areas of the world, life pyramids against itself and in its confusion has finally allied itself with the enemy, non-life. And what the scorching, searing, freezing, poisoning weapons of non-life have failed to do may be accomplished to the end of its destruction and extinction by the tactics of survival gone sour. If the most versatile of living forms, the human, now fights for survival as it always has, it can eliminate not only itself, but all other life. And if that should transpire, unwanted places like the desert might be the harsh mother of repopulation. For the inhabitants of the desert are well-trained and well-armed against desolation. Even our own misguided species might reemerge from the desert. The lone man and his son tough and his son toughened wife who cling to the shade in an unfruitful and uncoveted place might, with their brothers in arms, the coyote, the jackrabbit, the horned toad, the rattlesnake, together with a host of armored insects, these trained and tested fragments of life might well be the last hope of life against non-life. The desert has mothered magic things before this. That's a wonderful section. Yeah, that that is just. Yeah. <laughs> that's why he was a Nobel Prize winning. I mean, that is just gorgeous writing. Yes. And reflections on humanity, nature, the universe, the cosmos, the struggle to survive, what humans can do to that no other species can do, which is destroy the whole thing. Um, just really just, you know, I think he is like, when he starts writing about nature, you can see like he has a love for it. It's funny, people don't think Steinbeck nature, but that's how I have always thought of him after reading this book. Like he has such a love of nature and such a, a distrust and a nervousness in cities. Um, and he does not like traffic if you haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> huh. So um, I, I think that that section we just read, it's just between the bar scene with the really intricate local language and then him writing about his home and the last time he's ever going to see this valley. And he's sitting there with Charlie, talking to Charlie about the beauty of the valley and then going into the desert and just discussing basically the history of life through the lens of the Mojave Desert and two coyotes. It's just brilliant writing. I mean, it's just brilliant writing. So. I am always glad to read this book out loud to people because there are sections in it that just make you marvel that somebody could put that down in print. So yeah. any last thoughts on, uh, on this last uh, section that we read today? So I think, let's see, today's the sixth and the 13th and the 20th. We're on page 
161. And yeah, we should be finished. Yeah, we'll finish on the 20th. So there'll be two more sessions um, and we'll finish. I don't know how many that makes. It's more than 12 though. Is that 14 altogether then? I think it's 12 total. I think we were planning on 10 and we're at, we'll be at 12. I could go back and count. Yeah, yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have to go back. I think it's, yeah. But yeah, so the- I think this is number 10 that we're on right now. Is it? I think so, yeah, because I've been putting them up um, on YouTube because there are people that like to watch later on with their dinner, that kind of thing. So I've been putting them up on YouTube for residents. Oh, that's cool. So I, I, I accompany like a wine, I accompany the meal. <laughs> yes, you do. You do. A fine like, wine, a fine yeah. wine. Yeah. You're like the you're like the guy by the table side with the violin. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so thirteenth and the twentieth, and and we will uh, we will be done. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Jake. Thank you. Have a nice week, everybody. All right, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.